Throughout the offseason leading into the 1973 campaign, rumors were wild about owner John Meekham selling the Saints for a dollar amount around $16 million so that he could take the money and use it to buy the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Meekham had been involved in auto racing for years, including the car he owned, won the 1966 Indy 500. For a good while, he had serious talks with George Gillette, the owner of the Harlem Globetrotters, to buy the team. But after failed negotiations and to a large degree reconsideration on his part, he decided before training camp that the Saints were not for sale. The 1973 Saints campaign started off rocky as head coach J.D. Roberts was fired four games into preseason and newly acquired offensive coordinator John North became head coach. He had previously worked for the Detroit Lions. His intricate offensive play calling setup led to a lot of confusion and the Saints would lose their first two regular season games, 62-7 at home against Atlanta and 40-3 at Dallas on Monday night. After the Dallas loss in which the Saints fumbled six times, fan favorite wide receiver Danny Abramowitz asked to be traded and the next day he was to the 49ers in return for San Francisco's fourth and fifth round draft choice selections in 1974. New Orleans would go in a more positive direction starting in October with their first victory on the 7th, 21-16 over the Chicago Bears in Tulane Stadium. However, this game is much more remembered for one of the more famous bloopers in NFL Follies history. Saints have the ball at the Bears' one-yard line, trying to get in. Manning tries to sneak it. He has the ball not loose. Jess Phillips tries to fall on it. It's rolling backwards away from the line. Lynn Garrett tries to fall on it. He can't get it. Bob Newland can't. Carl Johnson tries to fall on it. And the Bears have recovered the fumble near their own 35. Looks like they'll spot it at about the 32. Bob Pifferini recovers the fumble for the Chicago Bears. What an incredible fumble that was, to say the least. Then on October 28th versus the Redskins, the Saints defense has five sacks, and new kicker Bill McClard makes four field goals for a 19-3 victory. On November 4th, the Saints recorded their first ever victorious shutout, 13-0 over Buffalo, and held running back O.J. Simpson to 79 yards rushing en route to a then-NFL record 2,003 yards in a season. After a promising 4-4 mark after eight games, the Saints slipped through their last six games and finished the year 5-9. and nine. 1974 was the second straight year the Saints finished the season 5-9. and nine. Their defense, known as the Crunch Bunch, was second in the NFC in sacks with 37. Their 14-13 win over Atlanta on September 29th ended an 18-game road losing streak. They closed out their very last game at Tulane Stadium with a 14-0 win over the Cardinals on December 8th with rookie Alvin Maxson rushing for over 140 yards. Maxson led the team in rushing, Bob Newland in receiving yards, Howard Stevens in return yards, Joe Owens in sacks, and for interceptions a tie at four between Ernie Jackson and Terry Schmidt. One of the more interesting moments of the season occurred October 27th in a win at home against Philadelphia. The Tulane Stadium crowd got so angry over a pass interference call against the Saints, a resulting 22-minute boo occurred that was so loud the officials actually halted play for that length of time. The crowd would eventually quiet down after the officials called two unsportsmanlike penalties against the Saints because of the home field noise. While it's easy to remember the booing from that contest, it's sometimes easy to forget that the Saints had to come back late to win the game. Oh, three, both on the clock. Manning breaks the huddle, getting ready. This is going to be an exciting time here for the Bulls of Blaine Stadium. There's the snap. Manning pitches back to Phillips. Phillips runs to the left. Got a block from Beasley, and he's in for the touchdown. Jess Phillips takes it in from three yards out, gives the Saints the lead, and I don't think the Eagles are going to overcome. And now it's time for another Saints timeout. This time we detour to look back at Super Bowl IX. On January 12, 1975, Super Bowl IX was played at Tulane Stadium, though it was originally scheduled for the Superdome, but delays in construction prevented it from being used. Head coach Bud Grant's Minnesota Vikings faced off against Chuck Knoll's Pittsburgh Steelers. Each team had 10 regular season wins. The first half was a true defensive battle with the only score coming on a safety. in a defensive struggle. The Vikings tried to come back near the end of the first half until... Safety men, Glenn Edwards, always coming. And he 
there's a pop. And then there's a good pop. It bounces up in the air. Mel Blunt's 47 over. He's watched it come through. At times, it was a turnover-filled contest, largely due to wet field conditions from earlier rains in addition to the age of the AstroTurf. The second half witnessed the Steelers recovering a fumble on the opening kickoff. And it is fumbled by McCollum and just saved. Let's see who's got it. Marv Pellum. Pellum recovered. Uh, uh, look at his foot step. Uh, that's yeah. the soccer style and this field has been slick. That ball was not kicked the way he was trying to kick it. Correct that. Brown fumbled the ball and Marv Pellum recovered. Then later scored on a Franco Harris nine-yard run. The Vikings would score a touchdown on a block punt in the fourth quarter. Look out! Harry Brown recovered it. Matt Blair blocked the punt and it's recovered in the end zone by Terry Brown. But the Steelers would later put the game out of reach on a 66-yard drive. 3.40 to go. There's a rollout. Right Harris would be named game MVP and set a then Super Bowl record 158 rushing yards while the entire Viking squad was held to 17 rushing yards. The 1975 Saints only real highlight of the season was moving into the Superdome where 72,000 plus fans filled the seats for the club's first ever preseason game versus the Oilers in a 13-7 loss. The Superdome was way over budget with its official final building cost $162 million. The original projection was $46.7 million. It's estimated some $50 million of that $162 figure was money that the state spent on lawsuits from individuals who were fighting the dome being built in the first place, in addition to interest rates on construction projects at the time being an astronomical 22% a year. Another reason why the dome expenses went up, when the state legislature was allocating money for the project, they actually forgot to put in dollars for, believe it or not, seats. John North would only coach the Saints for the first six regular season games that year. He would be fired after a loss to the Rams on October 26. His only win in that stretch was on October 12th. It was over the Green Bay Packers. Well, here we go. The Saints with their first opportunity to win a home game in the regular season in the Louisiana Superdome. A 20-yard field goal attempt by Rick Zara. There's the snap from Hill, the placement. The kick is up, and it's good. And this game is over. Once again, you can hear it in the crowd. The New Orleans Saints have won their first regular season game in the Super Bowl. And what is some of Coach North's memories about New Orleans? Well, but we were fortunate that year. We won five, I think, and lost nine or something like that. Well, I know what he was. <laughs> uh, but anyway, we felt like we had a good start. And then the next year, of course, we had the strike. And that set us back. And one thing after another. The next year, we had the flood in Thibodeau. And... We didn't have it up, but that's my excuse is I had an opportunity and we just didn't get it done and, and that's part of the business. The name of the game is to win and we didn't. The other game the Saints won that season just happened to be the first for interim head coach Ernie Hefferly. November the 2nd in the Superdome over the Falcons, 23-7. to Story goes in the locker room before the game that Coach Hefferly gave a very rousing Newt Rockney type speech to the team. Here's Ernie Hefferly talking about a potential follow-up to that first speech. The next week... Coach says, Ernie, give that speech you gave last week. I says, it's up to you guys to get them ready. I can't be doing this every weekend. <laughs> so that was the end of that. <laughs> Mike Strawn would lead the team in rushing yardage for the season. Alvin Maxson in receiving yards, even though he was playing out of the running back position. And Tommy Myers led the team with five interceptions. And now it's time to take another Saints timeout. On January 26, 1976, the AFC-NFC Pro Bowl was played in the Superdome with Billy White Shoes Johnson named game MVP. The NFC won 23-20 thanks to a touchdown pass from Mike Barella to the Cardinals' Mel Gray with 109 left in the game. The 1976 Saints started anew with King Henry Hank Stram taking over as head coach. Hank Stram had been well known for being the Super Bowl winning coach in the 1969 regular season with the Kansas City Chiefs. 
and in a 15-year career there had several division titles as well. Some of his football innovations include stack defense, where three to seven men would line up on the line of scrimmage, and any number of them would try to rush the passer or back off into coverage. He also created the moving pocket designed to help give the quarterback more time before throwing the football. Playing in New Orleans like we have in the past, why I sincerely felt that it was really one of the great, had the potential to be one of the great franchises in the National Football League. Uh, as a result, we're going to do everything we possibly can uh, to fulfill a commitment that we're going to make. It would be silly for him to make any kind of a timetable to you as to how soon we'll be able to accomplish what we want to accomplish. But the only thing I can promise is that we're going to spend uh, every available moment building and uh, thinking and scheming and whatever we have to do to, to make this the kind of a franchise I think it deserves to be. And led the team to a 4-10 record. He drafted Chuck Muncie and Tony Galbraith in the first two rounds of the draft. And those two top running backs proved their worth on September 26th of 76, ironically, when Hank Stram had to go back to Kansas City to face his old team, the Chiefs. It was the first time in Saints history that two individual running backs had a minimum of 100 yards rushing apiece. In this case, Tony Galbraith 146, Chuck Muncie 126 in a 27-17 victory over those Chiefs. In fact, near the very end of the game, Hank Stram had quarterback Bobby Scott run up the score by throwing a touchdown pass to tight end Henry Childs. But even before the 76 season began, Hank Stram knew that he may have some difficulties being Saints head coach. He told a story one day that before the 1976 college draft, he was trying to make trades to get John Riggins, fullback from the New York Jets, and Freddie Dreyer, defensive end from the Rams. Then he noticed a note on his desk that said, as of this moment, all trade negotiations are off, signed John Meekum. When Stram called John Meekum to ask about the note, Meekum swears he doesn't know anything about it. A couple hours later, Meekum calls back Stram and tells him that one of Meekum's personal assistants signed that note without permission. Meekum went on to state because he knew that personal assistant for years and felt that he meant well, they were going to go ahead and cancel the trade negotiations, to which Hank Stram replied, well, who's running this asylum anyway? Another issue Hank Stram had to put up with was John Meekum elected to keep Dick Gordon in the front office. While it was in Hank Stram's contract that he had the right to hire and fire anyone in the football side of the organization. For all intents and purposes, Gordon would stay out of Hank Stram's way and then would be let go after the 76 season over what John Meekham considered budget cuts. Archie Manning wouldn't play in 1976, though he was on the active roster early on in the season due to complications following shoulder surgery. They went on to shut out Atlanta 30 to nothing on October 10th, plus Maurice Spencer set an NFL record by recovering three opponents' fumbles in one game and even won two games in a row in November over Detroit and Seattle. The 1977 Saints turned out to be a season of disappointment. Hank Stram's team finished the year 3-11. Archie Manning returned to quarterback and played in all or part of 10 games that year. The only three wins were at Chicago 42-24 on October 2nd, in which the Saints scored two defensive touchdowns. As Avalini takes the deep drop, here's the big rush, free football. This might go the distance. Bob Pollard with the lineman's green. Alex Price was the man who came in, hit Avellini, and knocked him free. Jim Merlo picks it up. He returned two for touchdowns last year. He's going to get his first this year. Guys closing in on him, but Merlo goes into the end zone for a touchdown. Cut by Walter Payton, but the impetus of Payton hurtled himself and Jim Merlo into the end zone. October the 30th versus the Rams, 27 to 26, partially thanks to a fake field goal. But Rick Dara, remember, he made a 23-yard field goal, and he missed one from the 50. And look out, it's Blanchard passing in the end zone. Oh, oh, oh what a play. Where did that one come from? I don't know. I never saw Lois Grooms make no catch before. All the time, a defensive end, and he's in there on the offense to catch a touchdown. And November 20th versus the Falcons by the score of 21 20, thanks to near game ending touchdown. Archie Manning on second and 15. He's got protection throwing. Giants. Touchdown catch of the year. And Hank Stram is up and jumping on Archie Manning. On November 13th, Rich Zaro had a chance to put the Saints in the lead with under two minutes to go, but his field goal attempt hit an upright. As a result, the game went to overtime, in which the 49ers won 10-7. Two weeks later, on November 27th, the Saints at the 49ers in a back-and-forth contest, which was decided on the last play of the game on a Ray Wershing 49ers field goal, and the 49ers won 20-17. Most fans likely remember December 11th, when the Saints lost to Tampa Bay 33-14, giving the Buccaneers their first ever win after losing 26 straight games. The contest featured Tampa Bay running back three interceptions for touchdowns.
Chuck Muncie would lead the team with 811 rushing yards. Tony Galbraith led in receiving with 41 catches. However, Henry Childs would lead in yardage with 518. And Chuck Chris would lead in the interception category with four. Almost a month after the 1977 season ended, John Meekham decided to let go Hank Stram. However, Meekham didn't tell Stram directly he was fired. Instead, he asked front office personnel Eddie Jones and Harry Holmes to tell Hank Stram on his behalf. A practice that members of the media have stated was very common most of the time with John Meekham. Stram's firing did anger a lot of fans and also angered ABC's Howard Cosell, who stated at a public appearance, that the one who should be fired from the Saints is John Meekham, to which Cosell further stated that with all the front office changes that have occurred since the New Orleans Saints had been established as a franchise, that maybe the one doing the firing is the one who should be let go, to which the Saints had to turn another page in their history. And now it's time for another Saints timeout. On January 15, 1978, some 76,400 fans packed the Louisiana Superdome for Super Bowl XII as the Denver Broncos, led by head coach Red Miller, took on Tom Landry's Dallas Cowboys. This also marked the first time the big game was played indoors and the first time most of the game was played in prime time. This also marked the first and only time the Super Bowl MVP was given to two players in the same game, Dallas's defensive tackle Randy White and defensive end Harvey Martin. Dallas's doomsday defense forced eight turnovers and eventually forced Broncos quarterback Craig Morton, a one-time Cowboy, to the bench in return for Chalmette, Louisiana native Norris Weiss. Tony Dorsett puts the Cowboys on the board. He's only the sixth touchdown rushing against the Denver defense this year, and it came after a turnover, the INT. He's a mean motor scooter, I'll tell you that. Haven Moses. Picked off by Benny Barnes at the 40, the third Dallas interception. Intercepted number four, this is Mark Washington. Going deep. Oh, what a catch! It is a touchdown! Johnson! What an effort! A 45 yard touchdown shot from Staubach. The ball is thrown beyond Butch Johnson. He only has to have possession over the goal line. That ranks right up there with the ones that Lynn Swan made two years ago. Horton on the sideline looks on, Norris Weiss remains the quarterback. First and goal at about the half yard line. Rob Lytle and Jim Jensen behind Weiss. Touchdown, Denver! Here's the touchdown. Jensen leading in. Maurer takes Harvey Martin inside. And Rob Lytle burrowed into the end zone. Back to Newhouse, option pass. Deep for Golden Richards. Touchdown, Dallas! Foley wasn't ready. 30-yard touchdown pass. Dallas defensive back Randy Hughes set a then Super Bowl record with two fumble recoveries in the game in addition to having an interception. Plus, Robert Newhouse became the first running back to throw a TD pass in the big game. Another trivia note, this game marked the first Super Bowl where someone other than the referee tossed the opening coin flip. Here it was Hall of Fame legend Red Grange. The Saints didn't have to look far to hire a new head coach. On February the 6th of 78, Dick Nolan was promoted to head coach after being hired a year earlier as linebackers coach under Hank Stram. Nolan had previously worked with the San Francisco 49ers as their head coach from 68 to 75, where he won three straight division titles from 70 to 72. Here's Dick Nolan addressing some fans in August of 78, followed by a sit-down interview. This is the time when 28 coaches are promising their fans the world. Championships don't just happen, they're built. I'm not going to promise anyone where we will end up in the win-loss column. That is often such an empty promise. I just want to leave it at this. When we walk off the field from our last game in the 1978 season, I honestly believe you will be proud of this Saints team here today. I told John Meekin that first year we'd have the best record he ever had, which we did. We were 7-9, and nine, and then the next year I told him we'd be better than we were, and we were. We were 8-8. Eight and eight. And then uh, the third year, he just brought in a lot of people we didn't need. However, the Saints made an interesting decision after firing Stram, but before hiring Nolan. On January 31st of 78, they elected to trade away defensive tackle Bob Pollard and guard Terry Steve to the St. Louis Cardinals in return for guard Conrad Dobler and wide receiver Ike Harris. On the same day Dick Nolan was hired, longtime front office men Eddie Jones and Harry Holmes were promoted to executive vice presidents. Going into the season, Dick Nolan drafted Wes Chandler, wide receiver out of the University of Florida with the Saints' first round pick, a move which greatly assisted one of the more memorable offenses in club history. Nolan created the flex defense 
defense, where four defensive linemen line up slightly away from the line of scrimmage in order to help stop the run better. In return, good cover cornerbacks would be needed to help cover the pass. The Saints finished 1978 with their best ever record at the time of 7-9. The Saints won their second ever opening day game by defeating the Vikings 31-24, with Tommy Myers getting three interceptions. Some of the more interesting games that year included September 24th at the Cincinnati Bengals, where Saints kicker John Leopold, one of four kickers the Saints had that year, made a 27-yard field goal in the last play of the game that hit an upright and bounced through to make the final score Saints 20, Cincinnati 18. This season also marked the first time New Orleans beat the 49ers twice in the same season. After winning three games in a row in October, the calendar turned to November and unfortunately so did the Saints' fortunes. On November 5th, they played at the Pittsburgh Steelers, but with 1.51 left, Steelers quarterback Terry Bradshaw throws the winning 24-yard touchdown pass to Rocky Blyer to seal that game 20-14. The next week, the Saints are at home against the Atlanta Falcons. It was the first time a Superdome regular season game for the Saints had sold out, though not in time to lift the local blackout. Late in the contest, the Saints had the ball fourth down and two just past the midfield stripe. The Saints elected to go for it and didn't quite get enough yards for the first down. As a result, the Falcons would get the ball back and on first down, would make a memorable play. We've got 19 seconds, first and 10 on their own 43. The Falcons with no timeouts remaining, and you can bet Barkowski's going to do what he's done about 10 times today, crank back and throw it as far as he can down the right sideline. That's exactly what he's doing. He's throwing a deep one, deep, deep, deep. It's deflected, and it's caught. It's caught. It's caught. Touchdown, Falcons. Over the Jackson, the rookie from Texas, caught the deflected pass and ran into the end zone. Ten seconds remaining, and the Falcons have pulled this one right out, and it's an amazing turn of events, almost unbelievable. And then two weeks later, the rematch at Atlanta. Near game's end, Steve Barkowski throws a pass into the end zone, which is intercepted by Ralph McGill of the Saints. However, an official on the play ruled that Maurice Spencer interfered with the offensive receiver. Later, the National Football League told owner John Meekham that the flag should not have been thrown. But as a result, Atlanta gets the ball on the one-yard line, and on that last play, Jim Mitchell catches a one-yard touchdown catch for once again to give the Falcons a win. 20 to 17. Overall, it was a better season for the Saints, but a lot of work was still needed down the road. The 1979 Saints wound up finishing with the then best ever club record at 8 and 8. The offense had over 5,600 total yards, and the offensive line set a club record for lowest number of sacks allowed at 17. The defense, running head coach Dick Nolan's flex formation, still struggled at times with the concept. However, the defense did set a team record that year with 46 sacks. The regular season would start on September 2nd at home against the Atlanta Falcons, the first time the Saints sold out the Superdome for a regular season game and did so in time for the Metro blackout to be lifted. A back-and-forth high-scoring contest that wound up in overtime. It would be in the extra period. Special team snapper John Watson would make a critical mistake. Hey, over the head of Herx Herx picks it up and tries to throw it. It's intercepted. The interception was caught by Falcons' James Mayberry. Final score, Atlanta 40, New Orleans 34. Two more losses would follow, and then a team meeting was held. An agreement was made to try to change things up on both offense and a little bit on defense. And as a result, the Saints would wind up winning seven of their next ten games, including October 14th at the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. The Saints would win 42-14. After a scoreless first half, the Saints scored six touchdowns on consecutive drives to set a team record. Then on October 21st, a home game against the Detroit Lions, the Saints would win 17-7. All four starting defensive backs, Eric Felton, Ray Brown, Clarence Chapman, and Tommy Myers, would each have an interception. Myers' interception would be run back for a touchdown. And then October 28th at the Washington Redskins, the Saints would win 14 to 10, largely thanks to the defense holding the Redskins from scoring on 17 different goal-to-goal -goal situations. In addition, with under two minutes to go, Saints defensive end Eloyus Grooms would sack quarterback Joe Theismann on fourth down to allow the offense to run out the clock and win the game. After this win, the Saints were all alone in first place of the NFC West for their first time ever. 
The excitement Saints fans were feeling at the time was greatly summarized by a quote used by Wayne Mack, Saints play-by-play radio man from 1976 to 81, following a Saints win. Okay, they'll be dancing on the tables at Pat O'Brien tonight. They'll be dancing on the tables at Pat O'Brien tonight. After 13 regular season games, the Saints were tied with the Rams for the division lead. And because of a close wild card race that year, the Saints would almost have to win the division to get into the postseason. Game 14 would be the swing point, December 3rd, Monday Night Football, against the Oakland Raiders in New Orleans. The Saints would build a 35-14 lead midway through the third quarter. And he's wide open over the middle. Oh, what a great call. Joe Galbraith was a receiver. Oh, a truly great catch. This is why we talked about Galbraith's ability as a receiver. It is super. That is unbelievable. He even turned in the air and right back with the right head and got it. Manny crossing his back. Going for Kyle. wasn't enough to seal the game as Raiders quarterback Ken Stabler came back to throw four second half touchdown passes and seal the win 42 to 35. Complete the French oh, move. Goodbye. Oh, 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 oh. Goodbye. There are no flags down. Is that wild? That happened fast. Stabler. The French touchdown. The French oh, 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 spectacular oh, in the determining factor for open here in the second half. It was during this Raiders game that Chuck Muncie became the first Saints running back ever to rush for at least 1,000 yards in a season, in this case 1,198 at season's end. The Saints won their last game of the year 29-14 over the Super Bowl-bound Rams. Five Saints that season wound up going to the Pro Bowl. Quarterback Archie Manning, safety Tommy Myers, tight end Henry Childs, receiver Wes Chandler, and running back Chuck Muncie, who was named Pro Bowl MVP. And now we'd like to close out this section with looking back at who we consider the better players by position for the Saints in the 1970s. Quarterback Archie Manning, running backs Chuck Muncy and Tony Galbraith, fullback Jack Holmes, wide receivers Wes Chandler and Bob Newland, tight end Henry Childs, offensive tackles Don Morrison and J.T. Taylor, guards Emmanuel Zanders and Conrad Dobler, center John Hill, defensive ends Joe Owens and Aloysius Grooms, defensive tackles Bob Pollard and Derlin Moore, linebackers Jim Merlo, Joe Fettersfield, Pat Hughes and Wayne Coleman, cornerbacks Ernie Jackson and Vivian Lee, Safeties Tom Myers and Chuck Chris. Kicker Gary Yaprimian, punter Tom Blanchard, return specialist Howard Stevens, special teams coverage Rich Maudie, deep snapper John Hill, and holder Tom Blanchard. The 1980 Saints season or some call it the Baghead season, started December 20th, 1979, when John Meekham announced that Steve Rosenblum would be the new general manager. Rosenblum had a falling out with his stepmother, Georgia Frontier, over ownership of the L.A. Rams, which for years was owned by Rosenblum's father, Carol, who had passed away earlier in 1979. He in turn hired Dick Steinberg to oversee personnel, and the Saints that following April in the college draft picked two of the better players of all time. Offensive tackle Stan Brock in the first round, corner back Dave Waymer in the second round. However, there were some issues in the front office between Rosenblum and Dick Nolan, and this infighting would gradually work its way down to the players, resulting in what would turn out to be a 1-15 season. Heading into the 1980 campaign, Rosenblum traded away Conrad Dobler to the Buffalo Bills. Some felt this had to do with some personal issues that Rosenblum may have had when he was with the Rams and Dobler was with the Cardinals. Also, when Tony Galbraith held out of training camp, feeling he deserved a better contract, Rosenblum wouldn't even talk to him. Galbraith would finally arrive at camp, but not until the last week he was in session. The main change to the Saints' defense run situations, they would go with Oklahoma defense, but stick with the flex defense and what they felt were passing situations. The regular season opener was a back-and-forth contest with the 49ers, and it came down to the last play of the game when Saints kicker Russell Erkslaven missed a 34-yard field goal that would have tied the contest, and as a result, the Saints lost 26-23. Three weeks later in Miami, the game that likely did end the team emotionally, Saints were down 21-16 with about 30 seconds left, when on fourth down, Miami tries to punt from the midfield strike. He is going to kick it. He has a block. They block it. New Orleans has the ball. Marty does a great job of blocking the kick. The Saints have possession on the 10-yard line. It's six seconds left in the game. Manning throwing, throwing, and there. Touchdown! 
Touchdown, the flag is down. They're calling pass interference on the New Orleans pass Saints. Pass interference call. Saints scored on everybody thought was the last play of the game. To pull out an unbelievable victory, but offensive pass interference is called against New Orleans. A couple days later, the NFL front office calls owner John Meekham to let him know the flag should not have been thrown. During the second half of the Miami game, Chuck Muncie was pulled from action. Apparently, a trade had been finalized during the game that would send him to the San Diego Chargers in return turn for a second round draft choice in 1981. For the record, the Saints would use that draft choice to pick Ricky Jackson. Dick Nolan would end up getting fired after game 12, which was on Monday night football against the Rams in the Dome, 27-7. A day after Dick Stanfell, offensive line coach, was named interim head coach. Do our best, and I think the fellas are ready, and they were called all week. It was a disappointment last week, but I think that thinking about this game, we were looking forward to a win. Stanfell meant business. He released defensive end Don Reese over starting a fight with teammates. He threw out the flex defense, and then the Saints got back to business. Those last four games of the season, the Saints were much more competitive. November 30th at home against the Vikings. The Saints were down 20 to nothing at one point. Near game's end, the score was 23-20 Minnesota. Saints were about to take a lead when Archie Manning rolls left for a touchdown. However, Tony Galbraith was called for illegal motion. So on the next play, with time running out, Benny Ricardo came out to attempt a field goal, which ends up getting getting blocked. The next week, December 7th, was at the San Francisco 49ers. Saints take a 35-7 lead at halftime. And then quarterback Joe Montana for San Francisco would lead what was then the greatest comeback in NFL history by scoring four touchdowns unanswered in the second half that would bring the game to overtime. And the 49ers would kick the winning field goal, 38-35. It'll be a 36-yard attempt, and the crowd will tell you. It's perfect, and the San Francisco 49ers have won in overtime. Crooms, number 78, for the New Orleans Saints, he just cannot believe it. A week after that, December 14th at the New York Jets would be the Saints' only win of the season, 21-20. A very competitive contest. Near the end, Russell Erksleben nails a 57-yard punt into the wind and snow to get the Jets well out of field goal range and clinch the contest. Here's Manning after the game, interviewed by CBS. Archie, this is Kurt Gowdy. I'm going to let your old coach talk to you, Hank Scrapp. Archie, this got to mean an awful lot to all of you. It was a great effort. Nice going. Well, thank you, Coach. It, it means an awful lot. You know what's been in the back of everybody's mind as uh, the season grew on that we were going to go, go through this thing without uh, winning a football game. So uh, we've come very close the last two weeks, uh, a couple times earlier in the year, but especially the last two weeks. And to finally get one today, uh, it's just one, but uh, it, it's just uh, it's a real good one for us. I'm glad we got it. We could have folded it up as we have many times late, but uh, I'm glad we won the game. Well, congratulations, Archie, and it's a great win for everybody. And I know everybody in New Orleans and the Louisiana area are very proud in Mississippi. And then it was time to rebuild the organization organization in a totally new direction. And now it's time for another Saints timeout. January 25, 1981, Super Bowl 15, his head coach Tom Flores and his 11-5 Oakland Raiders took on Dick Vermeil's 12-4 Philadelphia Eagles before 76,135 fans. Hello everyone, Dick Enberg, welcome to football's answer to the Mardi Gras. The Eagles seemed to be jinxed from the start as quarterback Ron Jaworski had his first pass intercepted by Raiders linebacker Rod Martin, where Martin went on to intercept three passes that day to set a Super Bowl record. Play action, Jaworski intercepts it by Rod Martin. Martin at the 40, he is to the Eagles 29-yard line. Intercepted by Martin. He was out of bounds, out of bounds when he intercepted the ball. It will count as a turnover. The same man who picked one off to start the game and led Oakland to its first touchdown has another. Jaworski Later, an Eagles touchdown pass to wide receiver Rodney Parker was called back on a penalty. He's buying time and throwing long for Parker. Touchdown! A flag is down. Rodney Parker, a New Orleans native, it appeared Carmichael headed upfield before the snap. Game solidified the comeback of Raiders quarterback Jim Plunkett, who didn't start until six games into the season. He would be named game MVP and threw three touchdown passes to seal a 27-10 victory for Oakland. From the two, third and goal. Bucket to throw. Touchdown! Good protection. Throwing for King. Could go all the way. 40, 30. Touchdown, Oakland. Play action. Going for six to Branch. 
Another noteworthy point came into the post-game trophy presentation, where many didn't know how Commissioner Pete Rozelle would react to giving his longtime nemesis, Raiders owner Al Davis, the Vince Lombardi Trophy. But the exchange went peacefully. Now, the Raiders became, of course, the first wild card to win the Super Bowl. I think it's a tremendous compliment to the organization because you had to win four postseason games. Today, of course, was the big one, the Super Bowl. I think it's a great credit to you for putting this team together. I think that Tom Flores clearly did one of the great coaching jobs in recent years, all season and particularly today. And it's a credit to some marvelous, dedicated athletes, especially Jim Plunkett and that offensive line today. You've earned it. Congratulations. On January 20th, 1981, General Manager Steve Rosenblum and Dick Steinberg, head of personnel, both resigned from the Saints. Two days later, O.A. Bum Phillips was named head coach. The New Orleans don't make any bones about it. They want you to win, and they want their team to win. They don't leave any doubt in your mind when you go in there who they're for. Phillips loved to emphasize running the ball on offense and stopping the run on defense using a 3-4 formation. Bum Phillips' first draft in New Orleans was one of the best in club history. It all started with first-round pick George Rogers. New Orleans chose me and um, I'm, I'm sure going to get my best and, and that's 100 percent every time I go out on the field. Other key selections from that draft included quarterback Dave Wilson, first round of the supplemental draft, plus safety Russell Gary, linebacker Ricky Jackson, defensive end Frank Warren, tight end Hobie Brenner, guard Louis Oubre, cornerback Johnny Poe, linebacker Glenn Red, fullback Hokey Gajon, and defensive tackle Jim Wilkes. Part of the rebuilding process included the releasing of several longtime players, including linebacker Joe Federspiel, guard Emmanuel Zanders, defensive tackle Alex Price, and a trade that sent running back Tony Galbraith to the Vikings. The 81 Saints finished 4-12 with George Rogers winning the NFL rushing title of 1,674 yards. Bum Phillips at one point started as many as six rookies on defense. The four wins included both meetings against the Rams where George Rogers had a combined 323 yards rushing and then a win over Cincinnati in the Superdome 17-7. In the contest, linebacker Jim Kovach had an interception and did something very unique after the catch. Here's Bum Phillips. It really amazed me. I didn't know where in the world he was going. And evidently he had promised one of those kids that wasn't physically able to intercept the ball. Doc had told him, look, the next time I intercept, I'm going to give it to you. I thought it was one of the best things I've ever seen a guy do. The most unselfish things that I've ever seen a guy do. Probably the win that meant more to Bum Phillips was going back to Houston to face his former team, the Oilers. The Saints walked away with a 27-24 victory, including George Rogers rushing for 142 yards, Jack Holmes with two touchdowns, and Kenny Bordelon with an interception. Some felt the Saints did rather well despite having 47 turnovers in the campaign. One of the more interesting decisions Bum made during the regular season was the trading of Wes Chandler. Some players felt it was because he got into an argument with Bum Phillips on the team plane back from a game at San Francisco over wanting the ball more. Another story claims that at a Saturday morning team barbecue, Wes Chandler was tired and went sit by himself at the practice facility, to which Bum Phillips thought that he didn't want to be a team player. But in essence, it was a triangular trade where Wes Chandler went to San Diego, San Diego sent wide receiver John Jefferson to Green Bay, and Green Bay sent wide receiver Andre Thompson to New Orleans. It was definitely a rebuilding year, but you definitely didn't hear the last of Big Bad Bum. Big Bum. Big Bum. Big Bum. Heading into the 1982 campaign, Bum Phillips was also promoted to general manager. On June 10th, Bump traded a number one draft choice in 83 to the Green Bay Packers in return for defensive end Bruce Clark. As a result, he then traded longtime Saints veteran defensive end Deloyas Grooms to the St. Louis Cardinals on August 3rd for an undisclosed draft choice. During training camp, quarterback Dave Wilson went down with a knee injury, and in replacing him on August 24th, Bump signed his former Oiler quarterback Kenny Stabler. Stabler would go on to be named starter on opening day of the regular season, and then a few days after that, on September the 17th, Bum decided to trade away longtime fan favorite Archie Manning to the Houston Oilers in return for tackle Leon Gray. It really hurt me to get traded. I had played that long and been told I was going to be here. I very much wanted to finish my career here, so it, I guess it broke my heart more than anything. And I told him, I said, you know, I, I'll forgive you for trading me, but I'll never forgive you for trading me to Houston. Because it was, it was a worse situation over there than it had been here. 
Many felt the trading of Manning also had a lot to do with Bum's philosophy of team chemistry, where bringing in players he was familiar with that he knew would get along with one another would lead to a better work ethic and as a result potentially more wins. It's estimated in Bum's five seasons in New Orleans, he brought in 13 ex oiler players. After a 1-1 one -one start, the NFL player strike canceled games before play resumed on November 21st. November 28th, the Saints upset the 49ers in San Francisco 23-20. Then on December the 5th, the Saints would lose 13-10 to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers in the Dome, when on the last play, Morton Anderson tried what seemed to be the impossible. Here we go. Guido Merkins will hold from the 50-yard line a 60-yard field goal attempt to it in overtime. It is up. It is no good. It was off to the right. He had the distance. It would have crossed the bar. It's easy to forget that Morton Anderson was actually injured during the first regular season game of 82. As a result, Bum brought in kicker Tony Frisch from the Houston Oilers to substitute. Bum decided to keep both kickers on the roster where Tony would kick the relatively shorter field goals. On December 19th in a loss to Dallas, Frisch missed two field goals in the contest. He was so upset that when the team plane landed in New Orleans, he went straight to his apartment, packed all of his things, and then drove back to Houston and never told Bum Phillips he was quitting. And then the final game of the regular season on January 2nd of 1983 in the Dome against Atlanta, which was a makeup week based on the earlier strike cancellations, Bum Phillips decided to run up the score because Bum felt that Lehman Bennett ran the score up on him a few weeks earlier. In this exciting Saints win, 35-6, the Saints would set a then-club record 32 first downs. Touchdown, Kenny Beckett! Down goes Barkowski in the grasp of Whitney Paul. We mentioned Erzlaven had a break. Yeah. They've got the Russell, he's going to throw a pass. He's got it complete to Bill Holy. He's loose at the 30, 25, 20. He's still open. Gets a block at the 15, 10, 5. He's got yeah. it. Touchdown. Listen to this crowd. Oh, how sweet it is. Body to the top of the screen. Wide right. Sweep to Wayne Wilson. Touchdown, New Orleans. That's Stacy Bailey, the rookie out of San Jose, pops it up, and the Saints have got the football. Dennis Winston. They go with a double tight end alignment. Larry Hardy and Rich Body. That's in motion, number 46, Oki Guy John. Wayne Wilson, touchdown. Big hole on the right side, Stan Brock, 67. Kelvin Clark, 78, opened it up. Commissioner Pete Rosell expanded the playoffs as compensation for the strike short year to eight teams per conference. The Saints at 4-5 and five with the highest ranked team not to go to the postseason in the National Conference due to a tiebreaker formula that allowed Detroit to go with the same record. The Saints finished a short season number one in total defense, a sign of things to come. The 1983 Saints campaign started on a bit of a downer for some fans as longtime favorite free safety Tommy Myers was released on August the 3rd. The 1983 Saints finished the season number one in total defense in the National Football Conference, which included 56 sacks. The defense's popularity gave them nicknames ranging from Southern Discomfort, the Cajun Crunch, Bourbon Street Bruisers, and Nitty Gritty Dirt's Band in relation to linebacker Dirt Winston. Unfortunately, the offense turned the ball over 47 times and eventually resulted in an 8-8 eight eight record. George Rogers would rush for over 1,100 yards that year, and Johnny Poe led the team in interceptions with seven. The Saints would start the regular season on September the 4th in a home win over the St. Louis Cardinals 28-17, George Rogers setting a then-team record 206 rushing yards. Two days before the game, WVUE Television's Ken Berthelot and cameraman Avis Landry aired a story about the St. Augustine High School football team. Their cameras caught the team on the bus going to practice, stating a very familiar chant. And from that point onward, it became the foundation of all Saints cheers. After a close loss the next week to the Rams at near 100 degree temperatures in Anaheim, the Saints would win their first ever overtime game back in New Orleans against the Chicago Bears. Spotted at the 31, Merkins holding. Morton Anderson gets it off, and it is good. 34 to 31. One week after that, on September 25th, the Saints would play at the Dallas Cowboys. The Saints would lose 21 to 20, largely because of quarterback Kenny Stabler being safety. It was the first time in NFL history that a team winning by one point in the fourth quarter lost by a point. The Saints defense would score their own touchdown against the Miami. Miami Dolphins in the Superdome one week later on October 2nd. Marino hit, picked off, coming back with it, Reggie Boyd. It was Frank Warren who came in, got to Marino, he lost the ball, Reggie Lewis, big number 98, rolled it in there. 
Saints go on to win the contest 17-7. One week later on October 9th at the Atlanta Falcons, the Saints would have to come back. It began with a long kickoff return by Kenny Duckett, and from there, Kenny Stabler would slowly drive down the field. Green seconds remaining. Morton Anderson will have the opportunity to kick one he's always wanted to do. 35-yard field goal attempt. The kick is up. It's high. blowout loss to San Francisco in the Superdome would follow. Then the Saints would squeak out a win at Tampa Bay on October 23rd, thanks in part to defensive back Bobby Johnson running back an interception for a touchdown, and offensive lineman Kelvin Clark recovering a fumble in the end zone for his own touchdown. And then a pivotal game on Monday Night Football November 21st. The Saints would have an 11-point lead going into the fourth quarter. That lead would slowly erode away, especially thanks to Kurt Spring's punt return for a touchdown. The Saints would try to come back. 19 seconds. It's only third down, a 51-yard attempt. Guido Merkins will put it down, Jim Peterzak will be the snapper. No, no. And why on third down? When you got Jimmy Stabler, I think you should take the other down. I do, too. Final score, Jets 31, Saints 28. And then yet another exciting contest, November 27, back and forth. The Saints winning 17-16, ironically, because former Saints kicker Benny Ricardo, then with the Vikings, would miss a late attempt. December 11th at the Philadelphia Eagles. Back and forth contest. Eagles kicker Tony Franklin had a chance to win the game with 18 seconds left in regulation, but pushed the field goal wide right. As a result, the game goes to overtime, and Morton Anderson makes the winning field goal in the extra period from 50 yards out. Final score, 2017 Saints. And then comes December 18th, 1983. Needing a win to capture a wild card berth, the Saints would not allow a single offensive touchdown by the Rams. However, the Rams made up for that by scoring two touchdowns on interception runbacks along with a punt return touchdown. Kenny Stabler would also be safetyed early on in the game. The Saints offense held their own, but on occasion needed a little good fortune to go their way. Third down, Rodgers. Ken Stabler wound up getting hurt in the contest, and Dave Wilson would have to go the rest of the way. With the Saints up 24-23 to and three and a half minutes left in the game, Bum Phillips decided not to go for a 49-yard field goal. Instead, Guido Merkins, who had to go in as punter when Russell Erksleben was allegedly hurt earlier in the contest, wound up kicking the ball in the end zone for a touchback. With 1.51 left, the Rams would slowly drive down the field to set up Mike Lansford's 42-yard field goal attempt. Here's the call with Jack Buck and Hank Stram. I snap. There's the kick. Go! Is that incredible? There are no flags, and we have only two seconds left. And look at that scene with the Rams. And now look at the other scene. It looked like a grenade has gone off in the New Orleans quarters. If they're all stretched out on the ground, they can't believe what has happened to them. And here's the other version of that call from Larry Matson. Six seconds remain. This is it. The snap is high. The snap, the kick is up. It's long. It is, it is good. They're mobbing Lansford. The Saints are down. And here's Bum Phillips remembering those series of events. If I had to do over again, I would do it the same way, strategically. It was a tough loss for Bum Phillips, and as one of his assistant coaches would state years later, for all intents and purposes, Bum quit coaching after that contest. And his remaining two seasons in New Orleans just basically went through the motions. And now it's time for another Saints timeout. <laughs> Most of the first half of the 1984 calendar year was about the New Orleans Breakers of the United States Football League. They moved over from Boston, and their team was sold to local owner Joseph Canizero. The head coach was Dick Corey. The club started off 5-0, would gradually taper off to 7-4 before ending the season at 8-10. The two main reasons for the slip in the record had to do with injuries on defense and a gradual drop in endurance of starting quarterback Johnny Walton, who was 36 years old at the time. The most noteworthy player was Marcus Dupree. He was a star running back for the University of Oklahoma who had transferred to the University of Southern Mississippi. When he decided to leave that school, the USFL ruled that he could immediately become eligible and the New Orleans Breakers were able to obtain his rights and signed him. Throughout the season, he suffered on and off from hamstring issues and would get just over 600 yards on the season. The leading rusher was Buford Jordan, who had over 1,200 yards and was a native of Iota, Louisiana. Other noteworthy players on the squad included wide receivers Nolan Franz and Frank Lockett, tight end Dan Ross, linebacker Marcus Mayrick, and kicker Tim Mazzetti. 
Because of the financial issues and the possibility of the USFL moving to a fall schedule, the team packed their bags and headed for Portland, Oregon in 1985. The offseason leading into the 1984 campaign had Bum Phillips trading a number one draft choice to the New York Jets in return for quarterback Richard Todd. The offseason was filled with speculation as to whether or not Saints owner John Meekham would sell the team. A group in Baltimore had expressed interest, but the stronger rumor became Jacksonville, Florida, as a group there offered Meekham $25 million in cash plus 10 years of guaranteed sellouts to move, but to his credit, Meekham turned it down. At one point, the concern of the Saints moving was so strong, then Governor Edwin Edwards told John Meekham Jr. that if he ever took the Saints out of Louisiana, he would make sure that he would never ever be able to do business in the state again. The most interesting move made during the season was on October 9th when Bum Phillips traded to get his old running back from Houston, Earl Campbell, in return for a future number one draft choice. It was a decision that brought up some degree of controversy. With that note, here's former Saints head coach turned CBS broadcaster Hank Stram about the trade. There's a lot of speculation all over town as to whether that's a good trade or a bad trade. Bum Phillips felt it was a good trade because it would help him win now. That's fine if they win now, but if they don't win now, they not only lose games, but they also will lose George Rogers. Many had also felt that Earl Campbell was past his prime and that Bum only traded to get him in so that he and Earl could finish their careers together. The defense continued its aggression with 55 sacks, which included defensive leaders like linebacker Ricky Jackson, lineman Bruce Clark, and cornerback Dave Waymer with four interceptions. And to no one's surprise, the Saints once again had the number one defense in the National Conference. This 7-9 and nine season started on a bit of an awkward note as Bum Phillips refused to name a starting quarterback until he literally arrived at the Superdome the morning of the first regular season game, a home contest against Atlanta, where the nod went to Richard Todd. Game 2 was an exciting comeback as the Saints beat the Buccaneers in the Dome 17-13. Hokie Gajon had a 51-yard catch to set up his own touchdown dive with less than two minutes to go. On the ensuing Tampa drive, a jumpy gather sack on fourth down would seal the victory. Likely the toughest loss of the season was on October 21st in Dallas. The Saints would have a 27-6 lead going into the fourth quarter, including this long Hokie Gajon run. On first down, Gajon left side. Gajon to the open. Doesn't have great speed, but he may not need much. Not great enough. Everson Walls doesn't have speed either, and Gajon goes a distance, 62 yards. This young man has really made a football player out of himself. But the Dallas Cowboys would slowly come back as their starting quarterback, Gary Hoganboom, was benched for Danny White. White would come back to eight and two touchdowns. Then after both Saints quarterbacks, Richard Todd and Dave Wilson got hurt, Kenny Stabler would go in, to which point near the end of regulation, the third Dallas touchdown would be scored. Stabler, fumble the ball. It's loose in the end zone. The Cowboys are there. Oh, no, I can't believe it. It was Randy White who hit Stabler, knocked it loose, and then covered the ball. No, it's Jim Jeffcoat. You're right on that, I think. The game would then go to overtime, where Dallas won the toss, elected to receive, and didn't give up the football. And this will be from 41 yards out. Yes, solid, perfect, this one's over. Uh -huh. the Cowboys come battling back. Not in a thing of beauty, but this could turn this football team around. Final score, Dallas 30, New Orleans 27. Five days later, Kenny Stabler announced his retirement from pro football after 16 seasons. Then on October 28th, a back-and-forth contest at the Cleveland Browns, which led to the Saints getting the ball back near the end and just getting it to Morton Anderson's field goal range. Wound down to six seconds to go. Now Morton Anderson will try and kick one of 53 yards to win the game. Merchants to hold. Yes! He made it! By about a yard, maybe two feet. Unbelievable. And notice the job that Guido Merkins had to do to get the laces away from the kick. Look at Bum. I don't think Bum can believe it. He can. Final score, New Orleans 16, Cleveland 14. And now as a little bit of land yap, here's Larry Madsen. Gordon Anderson coming right here. The holding phase. The kick is up. He's getting there. And then on November the 19th, the New Orleans Saints would finally break the Monday night jinx and win a contest on the primetime event 27-24. to The most noteworthy play from the contest against the Pittsburgh Steelers was former Steeler Dennis Dirt Winston running back an interception for a touchdown to seal the victory. We're inside seven minutes. Pick off! Oh, Dennis Winston, the former Steeler. Oh, Dirt's got to be happy. 
Frederick Winter, and you know he is thrilled. That'll teach you to trade me for a six-round draft pick. That's true. You're going to see some pretty good pressure by Whitney Paul. 47-yard <laughs> return. On February 14, 1985, John Meekham Jr. broke off talks with A.N. Prisker on buying the New Orleans Saints. After this announcement, Jefferson Parish Sheriff Harry Lee talked to his good friend, Governor Edwin Edwards, about a New Orleans-based businessman named Tom Benson, who he felt would make a perfect owner for the football team. Edwards was able to get both the Meekham and Benson parties together, and by March 12th, an agreement in principle was made for Benson to buy the Saints. The deal was officially finalized on May 31, 1985, for a total value of $70.8 million. Here's Tom Benson at that press conference. I never have coached a team or a play, you know, so I don't want to start doing that now. The other thing is we got the number one fans in the country, and I'm not kidding about that, you know. It was later disclosed that Benson only had to put $1 million down. Edwin Edwards was able to get several banks to come up with the rest of the money for Benson to purchase the team, in which he had a total of 10 years to pay off all the loans. With the success the Saints would have in Benson's early stage of ownership, he was able to both pay off the loans and buy out his minority owners in the Saints to become sole owner in 1990. The biggest offseason move was on April 25th, when running back George Rogers was traded to the Washington Redskins, along with future draft choices in the 5th, 10th, and 11th rounds of the 85 draft in return for the Redskins' first round selection. Story goes, Bum gave the Redskins the 10th and 11th round selections without them asking so he could leave the draft room early and go bet on the horses at the fairgrounds. The Saints would lose their first two regular season games of the season and then win three in a row, only to lose six straight after that. In that latter stretch, Bobby Hebert would start his first regular season game with the Saints against the Green Bay Packers. Strangely, his first NFL touchdown was not a pass. It was actually a reception after he pitched the ball off to utility man Guido Merkins, who in turn threw the ball to Abair for the score. One week later, on November 24th, at the Minnesota Vikings, it would turn out to be Earl Campbell's last big game in the National Football League, as Bum Phillips had him carry the ball 35 times to set a then Saints carries record, but the Saints would still have to come back after the Vikings tied the game with under two minutes to go, as Bobby Abair would throw the winning touchdown pass with 50 seconds left. Abair, just by pressure, and hits John Tice, and the tight end is going to go in and the Saints don't need the three, they get the touch. It's a great call, and I'll tell you what, that's going to do wonders for Bobby Hebert. Play action fake right here. Minnesota almost up there in like a goal line stance. Dudwell was coming in on a blitz, number 55. That's why the middle was open. So Minnesota took a chance, gambled on the blitz, and it cost them. Final score, Saints 30. Minnesota 23. The next morning, Bum Phillips elected to step down as head coach. Effective today, I've resigned as the head football coach and general manager of the New Orleans Saints, and the decision was mine and mine alone. My job here was to win football games, and my job here was to provide a winning season. Didn't do that. One day later, his son Wade Phillips, who was defensive coordinator, would be elevated to interim head coach. Here's a look back at his father's influence on his career. I've patterned most of my coaching, you know, from my dad, certainly. I think you're influenced by your father anyway, and then you go into the same profession, you tend to do a lot of the same things. I've always been proud that I'm his son and he's my dad, but I'm proud I work for him, as, as, as a lot of other guys can say the same thing. It was difficult taking over New Orleans. He retired, and he was really hadn't looked back since then and has enjoyed uh, his life as a rancher, really, since then, although he coaches me a lot. Wade would win his first game as interim head coach, and the Saints would go on to lose their last three to finish the season 5-11. and Wayne Wilson would lead the team in rushing with 645 yards. Hobie Brenner would lead in receiving with 42 catches for 652 yards. Dave Wehmer in interceptions with six. Ricky Jackson would lead the team in sacks with a total of 11. And Dave Wilson led the team in passing yards with 1,843. The offseason to follow would bring some of the more significant changes in New Orleans Saints history for the better. And now it's time to take another Saints timeout. On January 26, 1986, Super Bowl 20, as the NFC champion Chicago Bears, led by head coach Mike Ditka, faced the AFC champion New England Patriots, coached by Raymond Barry. The Bears dominated the contest largely thanks to defensive coordinator Buddy Ryan's 46 defense, which held the Patriots to only 123 total scrimmage yards. Bears defensive end Richard Dent was the game MVP. Hello everyone, Dick Enwood with Merlin Holson. As my friend Kurt Gowdy, the Hall of Famer, used to say, how about the game? Are we finally there? Second and eight at the 11. John Blackman was offside. So he is in the end zone for a touchdown. 
down. Chicago has six more. Two running back is Peyton. They've got nothing but linemen, including William Perry in the backfield. Perry will drive through, and following behind is McMahon for the touchdown. Second and 20. Here they come. A jailbreak. Wilson and Hampton this time. McMahon with good play action going for the bomb from his own end zone to Galt. They won't catch him except by the shirt tail. Marion saved a touchdown. So the Bears unloading with that great defense. They're showing all the weaponry and McMahon from his own end zone hits Galt for 59 yards. Refrigerator, he's a lone setback now and it's all disguised. McMahon rolls in a somersault six. The Bears lead 29 to 3. And intercepted for a touchdown, the rookie Reggie Phillips. The reality of first and goal. Perry, that one registered 3.8. Another Super Bowl record, the first refrigerator to score. And Walter Payton, I guess they figure they got a whole quarter to go. Another intercept on his way. Tim Morrissey to the five yard line. Jim Morrissey, the rookie from Michigan State. 44 to 10, the Bears. 46 to 10, the Bears. He was down, whistled at safety, Chicago. Henry Waxter. Henry Waxter, congratulations. You've just scored two points in the Super Bowl. Some fans were upset that as the game was winding down and the Bears having the game at hand, star running back Walter Payton wasn't given another chance to score his first touchdown of the game. A decision coach Mike Ditka years later stated that was a mistake and quote, you can take away my touchdown in Super Bowl VI and give it to Walter, close quote. Patriots wide receiver Irving Fryer scored the only New England touchdown. Bears wide receiver Willie Galt had 129 receiving yards. One of the more historic moves in St. history occurred on January 14, 1986, as Jim Finks was named general manager. The former Vikings and Bears GM had helped build those teams to playoff contention and was trying to do the same thing here in New Orleans. I've felt ever since they came into the National Football League in 1967 that this could be one of the great franchises in the National Football League. Potentially could be the best franchise in the National Football League. All you have to do is win, and we're going to find a way to win. Uh, when it's going to happen, I don't know, but I can assure you it will happen. On January 28th, Jim Finks hired Jim Moore to be the next Saints head coach. I can't tell you how glad I am to be standing up here today. I, I'm, I'm so tired of, uh, of being rumored. With an incredible amount of talent drafted in the April college selection, including tackle Jim Dombrowski, running backs Dalton Hewitt and Reuben Mays, and linebacker Pat Swilling, plus an influx of talent from the USFL, such as Sam Mills, Antonio Gibson, and Buford Jordan, plus selections from the National Football League's USFL supplemental draft of 84, Vaughn Johnson and Mel Gray, not to mention, of course, Bobby Hebert, who had signed with the Saints in 85. The Saints of 86 finished 7-9. and nine. Mays rushed for 1,353 yards. Eric Martin led in receiving yards and punt returns. Dave Wehmer had nine interceptions, and Jumping Gathers and Ricky Jackson each had nine sacks. Week 3 at the San Francisco 49ers in a loss, Bobby Hebert injured his ankle and would miss the next 12 regular season games Dave Wilson would fill in. In that same contest, Mel Gray would run back what was only the third Saints kickoff return for a touchdown at 101 yards. On October 12th at the Indianapolis Colts, Saints win 17-14, less than two minutes to go and the Colts at the Saints 16-yard line. Linebacker James Haynes forces a fumble, which is recovered by Johnny Poe to seal the victory. On December the 7th at home against Miami in a 31-27 loss, Saints drive inside to the Miami 10-yard line late, but Dave Wilson's pass on fourth down was dropped with less than a minute to go. Ruben Mays would rush for 203 yards and at one point had the Saints rushing record for a single game, but a penalty called back to play that would have decided the record. December 14th at the Atlanta Falcons in a 14-9 win. Less than two minutes to go, quarterback Dave Wilson runs a bootleg to score a touchdown to get ahead. And then the Falcons drive all the way down to the Saints 5-yard line. Ricky Jackson sacks quarterback Scott Campbell with five seconds to go. Falcons tried to come back and looked like they scored the winning touchdown pass on the next play, but the officials ruled that the ball was snapped after the clock ran out. The Houdat fan base was more than excited about the 86 campaign, but maybe even some of the bigger of diehards couldn't imagine what was just around the corner.